Um, so here we have an object that's sliding down a kind of wavy track. First it falls down, then it goes up, then it comes back down. It's got five kilograms. Um, we start 11 meters above the ground, um, and uh, we're going to end up here, say, at seven meters above the ground on this track. So we're never going to get all the way to the ground. Uh, and the question is, what speed will we be going at when we get to this point? What speed will we be getting at when we get to the seven meters, uh, seven meters height? Okay. Well, we can try to uh, work through this together. Um, and we're going to try to use this as our general framework uh, for attacking these problems. Uh, but these are kind of complicated questions, so uh, let me give you a, a handout that sets out the steps here. Step one, identify and label the initial and final points of the interval that you're thinking about. Well, in this case, I think they made it clear that we're starting at this initial point, and we're going to end up at this final point. This is a step that, unfortunately, people skip a lot, but this is important. Uh, notice that there's no way we can use this equation unless we know who the initial point is and who the final point is, because that's built into the equation. I think that the reason that people often forget this is you don't need this when you're doing, say, net force equals ma. With net force equals ma, you're usually just focusing at one instant. But when we're using this equation, we're focusing on an interval between an initial and a final point. So you have to be clear in your mind about what the initial and the final points are. All right, but now we're going to do the same thing that we normally do, which is identify all the forces on the object. Um, now, the forces will look a little bit different as we go because we're on a wavy track, but we can just pick, say, some point in the middle of the track. So maybe I'll pick, say, this point here. And identify what would the forces look like when we're at this point. Uh, well, can you identify what would be one of the forces on this box when it gets to this point? <coughs> Mg pointing straight down. That's the weight, and you're right that the weight would be pointing straight down. Good. And then the normal force perpendicular to the track. Good. So the normal force would not be pointing vertically. Instead, it would be perpendicular to the track, just like you said. That's good. Then the other forces on the object. Um, well, it's moving, so like the force of the movement. Okay, uh, I almost kind of bullied you into the wrong answer there. You were you were ready to stop. And then I kind of bullied you into thinking there was more. So you were right when you thought that these were the only forces. But let's talk about that force of the movement thing, because that's actually a common mistake that people make. First of all, how do you identify the forces? There's a systematic way for identifying the forces. First of all, everything has a weight, and you found that. And other than the weight, the only forces come from things that are touching the object. Well, what is touching the box here? Only the track. So that can be the only other thing that's going to be a force. Now, conceivably, the track could also have friction in addition to the normal force, but we specifically said in this case that there's no friction. So you were right that these are the only forces. So this is a good systematic method for finding all the forces on the object. Everything has a weight, and then ask what is touching the object. And if anything's not touching the object, it can't be exerting a force. Now, what was that phrase that you used? You talked about something like the force of the movement. And basically, we just want to say, that doesn't make sense. There is no force of the movement. Um, the forces come from things that are touching the object. Um, what you might have been thinking is you might have been saying, gee, at this point the object is moving like this. Yeah. What's the force that makes it move that way? But the, one of the big insights in physics is that your velocity in any instant doesn't get, tell you the force at that instant. Remember that forces are related to acceleration, not to, ve not to velocity. It's not force equals mv, it's force equals ma. So we don't need any force to be moving in this direction. Uh, if you want to explain it, you could say it's just the object's inertia that's going to make it move in this direction. Remember that once something starts moving, it's going to continue to move in a straight line in that direction unless there's some force to move it out of that place. 
So we want to get out of the habit of thinking that we need to explain the velocity in any instant. We don't need to explain that velocity, um, so we don't need a force to account for this velocity. Well, the safest thing is just ask what's the weight and what's touching the object, and then we won't get confused by a concept that turns out not to make sense like um, the velocity. All right. Um, all right. So I'm drawing the velocity here, but we don't want to make that think. Make, we don't want us to think that that's a force. That's just the velocity. All right. So those are all the forces on the object. Now we need to separate these into conservative and non-conservative forces. Well, is the weight conservative or non-conservative? Conservative. How do we know? Because we just memorized that a few minutes ago. If it wasn't conservative, it wouldn't have a potential energy. Now, how about the normal force? We didn't talk about the normal force before, but I said enough to figure out whether the normal force should be conservative or non-conservative. Non-conservative. Because a couple minutes ago, I said that the weight and the spring force are the only conservative forces you'll see this semester. So everything besides the weight and the spring force must be non-conservative. So we know this is going to be conservative, and this is going to be non-conservative. And of course, the velocity is not a force at all. So it is neither conservative nor non-conservative. So that was step two. We've identified all the forces, and we separated them into conservative and non-conservative forces. And like I said, the only conservative forces are the weight, the spring force, and the electric force in this course. All right, uh, now we're ready for our main framework, which is this equation over here. Here's the main equation that we're going to use to try to solve the problem. All right, so step four, we have to figure out what we should plug in for the work. So we're going to look at every single force, and we're going to decide whether that's going to give us a number to plug in here. Well, let's start with the weight. Is the weight going to give us a number that we should plug in here? Good, that's the right answer, because the weight is conservative. And we only remember that NC stands for non-conservative, so we're not going to plug in anything for the weight. Now, the normal force here is trickier. The normal force is non-conservative. But is the normal force here going to be doing positive work, negative work, or zero work? Negative. Um, we decided that. The weight here is not going to be doing any work that we need to include in the formula because the weight is a conservative force. We are only including the work done by non-conservative forces. Um, now, how about the normal force? Well, is the normal force here perpendicular to the velocity, parallel to the velocity, or anti-parallel? Does that mean it's going to change our speed or our direction? direction? Right. So is it going to do positive work, negative work, or zero work? Zero work, which I think is not what your first guess was in this case. I think at first you were thinking that this might do negative work. Yeah. Um, however, as we talked about, when the force is perpendicular to the velocity, it's doing no work. And the reason is because it's only changing our direction. It's not changing our speed. Um, so the normal force here is just changing our direction. It's the normal force that's fo forcing us to go through all these little um, loops and everything. The only thing that's affecting our speed here is the weight. For example, right now, the weight would be slowing us down since we're moving up the hill. Uh, but we don't need to include that because the work is a conservative force. All right, so this was the point of the work that we did a few minutes ago about set, uh, thinking about uh, whether forces are, par are parallel or perpendicular to the velocity. We need that so we can figure out whether a force is doing zero work or not. Um, so notice that it really was very important to write down the velocity vector here. If I didn't write down the velocity vector, I wouldn't see that this force was perpendicular to the velocity. So even though this is not a force, we want to have, compare it to the other forces. That's something maybe I should have put in that step-by-step -step method. Um, so part of figuring out the work is drawing the velocity vector. Because if you haven't drawn the velocity vector, you can't tell whether the force is parallel to the velocity, anti-parallel to the velocity, perpendicular to the velocity, or at an angle. So what did we end up with? What is the net work done by the non-conservative forces? Well, this is not giving us a number. And this is giving, not giving us a number to put in here either. So this is going to be 0 in this case. And now the formula simplifies to E initial equals E final, which is what's going to happen on most of the problems that you're going to do. Most of the problems will be conservation of energy problems, where the mechanical energy is going to be conserved. But you have to check, because there are, you will sometimes see problems where the energy is not conserved. I have seen that on, on sample tests and in the homework. So you do have to check to make sure that this term is 0. But in most cases, it'll be 0. That's what we have here. All right, well, now we can start plugging in.
Well, what should we plug in for the initial mechanical energy? Well, remember that that is the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy. And what could I plug in on this side? The final kinetic plus the final potential. So this is another very important equation that we'll be using a lot. It just is an expanded version of this equation. But now we have to start plugging in. Well, any idea about what we should plug in for K initial here? Zero. That's right. That's good. Um, I don't have it on the board anymore, but I think before I said that we were starting at rest. Well, if we're starting at rest, um, then we had zero initial kinetic energy. V would be zero in that formula. So that term is going to be zero. 